My name is Benjamin Lebwal. I'm the Director of Clinical Research at the Celiac Disease Center at Columbia University in New York. I'm an adult gastroenterologist. I've been a practicing gastroenterologist since 2010 when I completed my training clinically and also in epidemiology and research methods. So one thing sort of led to another and I found myself a gastroenterologist who specializes specifically in the diagnosis and treatment uh, of patients with celiac disease. In parallel, during my training, this interest in gluten really exploded. And uh, it turned out that many people who were interested in a gluten-free diet or trying to cut down on gluten actually didn't have celiac disease, which led to interest in studying non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, and so it's, it's really hard to predict where one's interests are going to lead and what's going to be hot and interesting in terms of uh, research and the public's interest. But as I uh, gained more knowledge about celiac disease and particularly uh, the toll it can take on the individual and on families, the burden of the treatment, it really uh, drove my interest in, in uh, improving the lives of patients and their families through research. I think that there are a number of interesting aspects of celiac disease to study. And uh, what I'm particularly um, uh, interested in right now uh, is the, the toll that strict adherence to the gluten-free diet can take on the individual. Right now, the only treatment we have for celiac disease is a strict gluten-free diet for life. We're hoping that that will change with the advent of non-dietary therapies, but it's really hard to predict the future in terms of when those will be available, how they'll be used, um, and how that will change the face of living with celiac disease. For now, Patients need to meet with the dietitian who's knowledgeable in the gluten-free diet, and they need to navigate various scenarios, eating out, traveling, social circumstances, uh, ingredient uh, checking, talking to wait staff, et cetera. And some people really uh, use this as an opportunity to sort of exercise their self-confidence and uh, they, they, uh, they thrive in that role uh, of self-advocacy. And it's really extraordinary to, to see some patients in action. Um, but others really uh, have trouble with it and it's not a job that they signed up for. They didn't choose to have to deal with this. Um, and we studied uh, adults and teenagers with celiac disease and performed in detail qualitative interviews not only about what they're eating but how they're dealing with the experience of having celiac disease and in this study we divided patients according to how vigilant they were in terms of their efforts to stay away from gluten. We recently compared patients who we classified as uh, hypervigilant. It's not, not a way to cast judgment, but basically these were the ones who were the strictest group that we could find in those who we interviewed. They perhaps avoided most or all restaurants, for example. Um, they would not take what we would consider calculated or mild risks uh, when uh, making their choices in terms of what to eat. What we actually found was that they reported a worse quality of life and uh, this was driven by worse mood overall um, and a worse perception of the burden of living with celiac disease with regard to how it was limiting patients. So uh, in a way, these results are troubling. They are a downer. They uh, imply that strict adherence, which is the treatment we have, comes at a cost. But with every crisis comes a potential opportunity. First of all, we see this as further ammunition to push for non-dietary therapies. And uh, we see the burden of treatment when we're talking to um, funders, uh, those who are investing in non-dietary treatments, anyone who's interested in studying celiac disease, we show them that the current treatment fundamentally is limited because of what it can do to people's quality of life. We have to admit, there are people who have celiac disease who feel perfectly fine right now. 
Some patients with celiac disease are undiagnosed and they're going to the doctor, they're not being tested, and it's our job to raise awareness among patients, among healthcare professionals, to get those patients diagnosed and treated and on their way to good health. But we have to acknowledge there are also patients who are doing well, even though they have celiac disease, perhaps a mild form of celiac disease. And we don't yet know whether it's our obligation to reach out, identify them, diagnose them, and put them on a diet. Are we serving them well by putting them on what we have to acknowledge is a difficult diet? And that's really something that we need to study more. We also know that even patients whose symptoms get better and whose intestines heal on a gluten-free diet, they many such patients find the gluten-free diet severely unsatisfying and limiting both socially and some people economically because of its cost um, and also because of the toll it takes on energy level because of the constant concern about where one's uh, next meal is going to potentially be safe or potentially unsafe. And so the gluten-free diet is, is not satisfactory as a treatment. In fact, the better we get at detecting gluten in food and in human tissue, the more we are now appreciating that a gluten-free diet for many is impossible. Many patients, even if they are strictly adherent, if we check, they might be exposed to trace amounts. Now the significance of being exposed to trace amounts of gluten is unknown, but it appears that gluten, because it's so ubiquitous in society, is getting into our food supply, and the implications of that might imply that we need non-dietary therapies to protect individuals from trace amounts of gluten exposure.